Hello and welcome to this episode of Empowering Lives video series. My name is Elaine Fernandez. I am the head of the psychology department here at Help University, Malaysia. Today, it's a pleasure to be joined by one of the world's most influential behavioral psychologists, Professor Stephen C. Hayes, who will be sharing his thoughts on racial division and why our prejudices lead to what he calls authoritarian distancing, uh, the unconscious belief that you need to maintain psychological distance from and control over persons we judge as other. Um, Professor Hayes is a foundation professor of psychology at the University of Nevada, Reno, and is the author of 46 books, including Get Out of Your Mind and Into Your Life, and his new book, A Liberated Mind. An expert on the importance of acceptance, mindfulness, and values, he is ranked among the most cited psychologists in the world. Uh, welcome, Professor Hayes, to this Empowering Lives video. Well, thanks. <laughs> Thanks for uh, having me. I'm looking forward to our conversation. Okay, so uh, just to get right into it, um, the the whole concept of prejudice is basically a very normal part of human experience. So normalized, in fact, that we often don't recognize uh, when when it's happening, um, or we don't really pay attention to it until something really jarring happens, like uh, the George Floyd murder in the U.S. So um, we, yes. what we'd really like to, to sort of talk about is why is it so hard for, for us to recognize when it's happening or even pay attention to it on a day-to-day -day basis? Yeah. Well, you know, some of these things come just from the importance of groups and groups of identity to us. I mean, we're the social primates. We evolved in small bands and and groups and we're used to uh, thinking in terms of us and them it's very very basic to um, to kind of how we evolved but we're in a world now where the us increasingly is all of us yeah. if uh, you know a covid crisis is a good example of that uh, the virus doesn't care what your particular ethnicity is or your uh, political system or your uh, race, ethnicity, religion, etc. It doesn't care. Global warming, the same thing. Our, many of our economic problems are similar. Um, you know, the immigration crisis that we face around the world that's coming from displaced peoples. At the same time, we have the ability to communicate instantly like you and I are doing right now. Uh, it's Wednesday here, it's Thursday there, we're having a conversation in real time. And so we're in a modern world where us has to be all of us. It really has to be in the sense that our survival depends upon it. I think you can really sense that now. There's a Malay, or kind of a feeling of an ease in the world. Mm -hmm. And uh, I think a lot of the political upheavals come because people are not sure what to do in this new world. And we need modern minds for that modern world. But what we know at the psychological level, uh, in terms of how these um, group identity and so forth, how that builds out is that there's a core of um, a failure of perspective taking, of a failure to be able to go behind the eyes of another, that of a person who's considered to be mentally, cognitively in another group, by your training, by your history, by your, uh, to some degree by your choice, but a lot of it's by your history. I mean, it, it digs into us with the jokes and the images and the television screens and the stories and the, you know, you don't notice growing up that you may not have friends of a different ethnicity or that you're watching television shows where women are always portrayed in a particular way or that, mm -hmm. Uh, you know, persons from different religious groups or, or nationalities are presented differently, but it seeps into you. So a failure of perspective taking is key. Um, uh, that is, I think, makes it then harder to have an emotional sense of what it's like to be behind the eyes of another person. Mm -hmm. And so you lack empathy for people when you can't take their perspective. And when you put them in the class of other, it's a lot harder for you to to feel what it feels like to be them. Mm. 
And then the final one that really comes together and the one I'm appealing to are the three biggest factors that we've found in our research that predict uh, the pervasiveness of, of prejudice is that when you do go behind the eyes of another, especially stigmatized uh, groups of all kinds, you will find pain there. And if you are unwilling to sit with that pain, if it's necessary for you to run from it, you'll objectify and dehumanize other pe people in order to do that. So those three processes of perspective taking, lack of empathy and failures in emotional openness come together and they predict uh, objectification and dehumanization in every area that we've ever looked uh, in, re in research. And we do find, you mentioned, there's this core that's there inside racial prejudice or prejudice against different religious groups and so forth, uh, uh, what has been called authoritarian distancing. Mm -hmm. The idea that I'm sort of psychologically up, different, away, and you're a threat, mm -hmm. and I am holding you at bay. And um, those, that process is predicted by those three things. So it's very hard to root out. It's in all of us. Uh, and yet we can, and I think must, yeah. do better. And... Um, over time with culture and what we do with our children, but even within our lifetimes, what we do with ourselves. Mm -hmm. You can't erase your history, but you can become more aware of your history and you can be more responsible about mm -hmm. how it plays out uh, in your uh, mind, emotion, behavior, uh, attention, sense of self, values. I think what you said So we've been able to do some work on that, yeah. on how to reduce it. Use it. We've been able to do some work uh, okay. re by using these ideas to actually reduce prejudice. Okay. Um, it's very interesting that you mentioned about how difficult it is for us to sort of perspective take when we uh, see people as other, um, even though technically we're all human beings and sort of have the same experiences. Um, sort of tying that back uh, to give it a bit of context to sort of like the George Floyd situation, for example. Um, the reactions to that uh, seem to be quite indicative, at least, of some element of empathy, whether it's personal distress or, uh, to an extent, some empathic concern. And do you think that might account for why this situation has led to so much more um, intersectional calls for, for a harder look at racism and prejudice uh, around the world, not just in the U.S.? Yeah, I think it has, but there's something in here that's a little bit dangerous and we need to watch. Yeah. Which is, and you can kind of see it, you see some polarization. Mm. Uh, here in the United States, there were some politicians who spread the rumors that uh, the George Floyd filming was a fake. It was done in a, in a television studio. It was there, put out to uh, promote a political agenda. I mean, most people would look at that and think that's crazy, but these were elected officials. Mm -hmm. I mean, they're not, they're not mentally deranged people. Yeah. But yet, they somehow thought it sensible to tweet out or to blog out such a crazy idea. Well, mm -hmm. why would that be? I think it's because in the modern world, if you think of these three processes of perspective taking, empathy, and um, emotional openness or in the, in the inverse experiential avoidance. The camera, the media, can do the first two for you. Right, yeah. And without you yeah. actually doing the work. Mm -hmm. I'm picturing the, the three-year-old Syrian boy who washed up on the mm -hmm. shore, fell out of the boat two years ago or so. Yeah. And uh, a, the family in a, a way overpacked boat trying to escape the war and make it to the Greek islands to, for safety, yeah? And the camera comes in and you see the tears of the mother and then you see this bloated body of a, a boy on the beach. I mean, we are not evolutionarily wired to be able to avoid the pain of that. Mm -hmm. We have mirror neurons yeah. responding to it. When we see something that horrific, yeah. Um, we, we cry, tears come to easily to us. So we've mm -hmm. taken the perspective because the camera gave us that perspective. 
and we feel the emotional response because the camera was able to expose us to the horror of that moment. But the camera can't do, the reporter cannot do, the modern media cannot do that last part. Yeah. It can't open the heart. It can't soften the judgment. Yeah. yeah. And so I think what we're seeing in our politics is that we're seeing a modern world in which uh, we're almost being thrown into the we, which in a way is good if we can step up to it because it is where we are. Mm -hmm. We live in an interconnected world. We can no longer afford to pretend as though people who wear turbans or some other crazy race or something, or you know, people who are a different color or, or, or some other, we can't do that. We, it, 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 time's up, you know? Yeah. And learning how to be emotionally open, to be cognitively flexible, to be able to be mindful and present and in your own skin as a conscious human being and to take on the pain of the world where we're living in a world where if anybody does anything really horrific in the next few minutes, you can see it on the, the screen that you have within arm's reach. Within minutes, you, you can pick it up on your iPhone or you can see it on your computer. Yeah? Yeah. And that's new. That didn't happen before. And we didn't somehow instantly become baby Buddhas in the last 10 years. Mm -hmm. We became, you know, uh, addicted to our screens. But that's not the same thing. Yeah. And so what I've write, written about recently is, and I think it's why mindfulness is growing so much in attention. Mm -hmm. And, you know, our, our wisdom traditions, our spiritual religious traditions, they, they can't do the heavy lifting the way they used to. Mm. There's just not enough. Uh, if you look at just church attendance and so forth, plus so easily it turns into dogma. Next thing you know, you have religious wars. I mean, you yeah. can take the mystics who will write the scriptural passages that contain wisdom, and then the followers will go to war with each other. So yeah. we're going to have to do it in a different way, not to subtract that. That's great if, if that's there. Uh, and I think, one chance that we have is Western science giving us behavioral science with tools that we can use that can reach normal people very quickly. And if I can point to something uh, that's hopeful in a way, sad in a way, those same three things, perspective taking, empathy, and emotional openness. If you're Weak in any one of those three, you tend not to enjoy relationships with other people as much. Mm. It predicts social anhedonia. Right. Of not really enjoying being with others. Yeah? yeah. And so there is a personal reason. It's not just that we know we need to step up to the challenge of this modern world with humanity itself being the we being the us, but it's also that uh, we're miserable if we can't engage in the processes that allow us to do that. Mm -hmm. And so, you know, with the screens showing us constant flow of judgment, comparison and pain, if we can't bring mindfulness values, emotional openness to it, not only will we see this kind of polarization of our politics and the scary kind of uh, harsh uh, treatment that's happening uh, by some of our less wise politicians and so forth. I think uh, what we're seeing in young people is gonna spread. What we're seeing is anxiety, depression, substance use, uh, PTSD, stress, and not just self-report measures, but suicide rates mm -hmm. in our young people that tell us that if we can't step up to the challenge of that, yeah. we're not gonna be able to be whole and free as human beings. So mm -hmm. it, as important as racism is and, and all of these kind of conflicts, it's also just important to the human heart because the modern world that gives us that instant perspective taking and instant sort of like empathy yeah. and then challenges us, what are you gonna do with that? Yeah. 
is the same one that can overwhelm us with uh, horrific images and comparisons and judgments that uh, our, our technological advancement is outstripping the cultural changes that need mm -hmm. to happen for us to catch up. Yeah. And uh, as I said, how to create modern minds for that modern world. So uh, we better get busy. And uh, frankly, the COVID crisis is a good time. A lot of us are spending a little more time at home. We have a little more time to read. We have a little more time to think about this. This is a good time to, to, uh, to look inside and mm -hmm. to work on how you can learn to be more fully present and open so that these uh, challenges can be met. Uh, by you, your family, your culture, your neighborhood, your nation, the world. Yeah. Yeah. So picking up on that about the uh, experiential avoidance and um, how big a role it actually plays ultimately in um, so many of these things, right? So you mentioned uh, psychological adjustment, um, your ability to connect socially, in addition to obviously how you interact with other groups. Um, how can we, what can we do to start moving away from that and moving towards emotional openness because uh, there are many reasons why we would be experientially avoidant and a lot of it has to do with the fact that we are overwhelmed with negativity all the time so it's much easier to just shut it down and you know focus on on sort of the things that we think are going to help us uh, be more positive and sometimes that can mean we are not acknowledging the things that are affecting us and that's also going to play a huge part in, in uh, how we are connecting with ourselves and with other people. So what can we do to sort of reduce that and, and try, I guess, step by step to, to go towards being emotionally open? Well, there, behavioral science can really help. And, um, you know, we're, we have several thousand studies to look at that have looked at this in the work on mindfulness, acceptance, values-based methods, uh, the so-called third wave of evidence-based therapies, uh, cognitive behavioral therapy, or CBT. Acceptance and commitment therapy act is probably the most studied of the ones, but there's many others. And, and uh, if you add it all up, just ACT alone has 400 randomized trials, 3,000, 4,000 studies on the processes, including all the way down to the basic cognitive processes that are involved, even in being able to take perspective or to categorize and judge. So we know a lot about how the mind works, and we know a lot about how to create more open, emotional openness. And it turns out you can't just do it just by uh, saying, okay, now I'm gonna be willing to feel you're going to have to learn how to rein in judgment mm -hmm. because immediately your mind's going to tell you, okay, I'm willing to feel as long as you only give me good stuff. Well, it doesn't come that way. I mean, even if I'm giving you a good loving relationship, you know that that will end because one or the other of you will die. Yeah. You know that sometimes you'll be disappointed. You know that you've been betrayed in the past. I mean, if you just take, a simple example of any emotion, any emotion that you want, when the mind tells you, yeah, I'll do it as long as I get only the good ones, it's giving you an impossible agenda. Mm -hmm. And eventually what happens is people begin to try not to feel at all, because even if you just say, okay, I'll only feel the good ones, eventually you can't even afford to feel the good ones because they will go away. And you know that. Yeah, That's an empirical fact. So experientially avoidant people, when they start feeling joy, very quickly they push it down. That, right. it's a, if you think about it, it makes you really sad because here they're wanting not to feel anxious or not to feel sad, but eventually the only way that they can solve this problem is to not feel at all. And you get the happy numb, which mm -hmm. is not happy. Mm -hmm. So we're going to have to rein in judgment. We're going to have to learn how to notice our mind judging things and use that when it's helpful what is the best way to do your taxes? What is the best way to fix your car? Helpful. Uh, what is the, the best way, uh, uh, you know, to um, uh, avoid all pain? Bad idea. Yeah. Um, we need to have learn more flexible attention because our mind will go to rumination and worry. COVID right now, I mean, it definitely is taking us off into the fearsome future. What will happen if? 
Uh, we're just a few weeks away from school here in the U.S., and uh, we still don't know if my 14-year-old, uh, now fit, uh, going to high school his first year, will be able to go to school. Mm -hmm. It's only a month away. We still don't know. Um, so we're going to need to learn more attentional flexibility. I think we need to find a part of us that's more, uh, that's less ego-based and more just aware. This uh, deeper sense of self, mm -hmm. of just a witnessing, noticing, observing, conscious, aware sense of self that connects you and consciousness to others. And I think we need to learn how to focus on our values and link our behavior to that. What do you really want to be about in the time that you have on the uh, on the planet and how would you want to build habits around that? Now, I've just given you six things and this, those six concepts are called psychological flexibility. Right. And so within the acceptance and commitment therapy or ACT community, to answer your question, we would say, you're going to, you can learn how to be emotionally open. However, it's one side of a six sided box. Right. And if you don't attend to the other six sides, this side can never be strong. Mm. The box is what's important. And so it sounds like a lot, but it's not overwhelming. We have trials that just a small number of hours of people working on those skills can significantly increase them. We've had studies with 5,000, 10,000 people followed for years at a time, and we know that they predict longitudinal course of development, either positive or negative. And so I can look at you and say, yes, this is important to learn. You can learn it. It's not necessarily expensive. We've done studies on our self-help books, for example, and about two thirds of what we get from therapy can we can get from supported engagement in a self-help book. Right. And part of that supportive engagement can be groups and things for free on the on Facebook and all of that. So mm. I think we're going to have to find a way to uh, take the core, what's in our wisdom traditions, our spiritual traditions, demystify it, and now put it into human culture in a way, in our schools, mm -hmm. in our workplaces, on our sports teams, in our organizations, in our families, in our community centers. Why? Because these processes help all those processes. They'll help you succeed at business. They'll help you do better in sport. They'll help you do better in dieting and exercise. They'll help you do better if you get a, an operation or have a physical disease. They'll help you do better with mental health issues. That's an empirical fact. So why can't we put it, these processes, into all these gatekeeper things that we do in our culture, mm. including things like diversity training, yeah. and how to deal with uh, institutionalized racism. Uh, many, many companies and universities and so forth right now are setting up programs to do just that. Mm -hmm. Let's get the best behavioral science we can, but also keep our eye on the possibility of doing something not just for that yeah. only, but for the larger set of skills that will liberate uh, human beings and help them come together in community with these values-based challenges that we face around the world. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I think where people are sort of open to uh, at least having that conversation, um, putting these interventions in place uh, would be, as you say, very effective on, a, on multiple levels, right? So if you can fix, fix um, sort of how people are able to interact with themselves and their issues, then there's a spillover into how they interact with others as well. Um, in communities though, where uh, even beginning to have the conversation about diversity, for example, is a bit of a challenge. Like in Malaysia, it's not easy to have uh, a conversation about racism because um, there's so much political and social uh, norms around uh, the idea that we are a harmonious society, we're a cultural melting pot, you know, there's not so much racism happening here. And there's a lot of uh, incentive to keeping that conversation underground um, or not shining a light on that. Um, in situations like that, where, for example, 
having this conversation in the classroom or trying to introduce something like this into a in, in an education setting, for example, how would you go about that? Um, and you know, sort of having that conversation, perhaps maybe not so directly, but still having the outcomes that you want uh, in helping people to learn how to perspective take, learn how to be emotionally open and clarify their values and so on. Well, one really important message is that it turns out we're not so complicated. We're not so different. There's not so many things. Um, my colleagues and I have looked at the entire world's literature on intervention science where psychological outcomes were the goal. Uh, we haven't yet published the study. We worked on it for three years, but we're now just cracking out the data. And I can tell you a little bit about what we found. We looked at every single study that has ever been done in the history of the world <laughs> with a randomized trial between a psychological intervention and a wait list or treatment as usual that found a mediator, a statistical mediator, which for normal people, I, I would just say it this way, it's, it's the functionally important pathway of change, not the only one. It's not a cause necessarily, but it's a functionally important way that you went from where you started to where you ended up, okay? And we reviewed 55,000 studies twice. Uh, it took us wow. two years to do this 110,000 <laughs> ratings. Well, we ended up with about 900 mediators, not distinct ones, but findings that we think are reasonably legitimate. Mm -hmm. Well, if you look at them, what you'll see is that emotional openness and flexibility, cognitive openness and flexibility, attentional flexibility, letting go of this sort of ego-based attachment to sense of self, being able to be motivated by your values, uh, being able to organize your habits about, about what you deeply care about. If you use uh, those and you just look at what percentage of the world's knowledge about processes of change when you intervene deliberately, not just normal development and so, but, but where, which has some special uh, advantage for your question because how do we intervene is the question when you say, mm -hmm. how will we change this? Yeah. yeah. Um, the kinds of things that I'm talking about take up at least 50% of the variance of everything we know in the world's literature. And if you get a little more flexible about the definition of it, I mean, there are a few, you're not really sure, you know, exactly where does self-efficacy, let's say, fit, a very mm -hmm. common mediator. When you think it through, it ends up really kind of fitting if you loosen it just a little bit. So here's my message to you. I think for the last 40 years, we've been trying to intervene in many, 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 many areas where psychological outcomes were important. If it's so, and you'll be able to review it yourself when the data are out and you can see whether or not we did it right. If it's so that, yes, of those 900 mediators, we really only have about 30 that are regularly found to be important. Mm -hmm. And then when you look closely at the 30, so many of them can be clustered. There's yeah. only about 10, 11, 12 things we need to focus on. So my, here's one way to answer your question. Instead of thinking so much about the particular protocol or the particular theory or the particular trademarked name or the particular science hero, instead, mm -hmm. why don't we focus on the processes that are important mm -hmm. and then think about where are the places in our culture where people are asking for help, right. where they want change, okay? And let's see if we can put into that moment some of these same processes. So for example, uh, at school, uh, people want help in dealing with the stress of getting through school. They want help in dealing with test anxiety and math anxiety and feeling insecure about their achievement, being able to, you know, t well, it turns out those same processes are there. Mm -hmm. If you go and you're gonna have a baby, you're worried about how you're gonna go through the procedure and you know, is it going to be painful? And well, you can put those processes in prenatal care. There's studies that have actually done that and get better outcomes. On the other side, if you're about to have an operation, mm -hmm. you can do preoperative and postoperative work on these processes. And guess what? 
you're much less likely to develop an opiate addiction. You're much more likely to not have chronic pain afterwards. You're not, so, and I'm deliberately giving you examples that are not racism. Yeah. <laughs> because I think there's a way of getting at it, which is if we can open your heart in one place, you have the skills to open it in another place. Mm. And some businesses, let's say, who know that for the communication of their work teams, they're going to have to deal with uh, racism and ethnic conflict and forms of communication because they know they're not allowing all their workers to be all that they can be and to have the, the business succeed unless they do that. Great, let's do that. In a moment like this with the Black Lives Matter, moment. I mean, people are taking anti-racism courses right now. Mm -hmm. So, and the, the people I'm talking about are people who sometimes, uh, you know, like folks who were trained to think that Confederate heroes in the South and the U.S. were somehow, uh, you know, some sort of hero or something rather than being, a, uh, you know, a people who are fighting to maintain slavery. Um, so, uh, I, my hopeful message would be, uh, the things that get us in trouble are not so complicated and the things that liberate us are not so many. And could we begin to deliberately come together with different ideas from different people with different language and different ways of talking about it. So you don't have to be shoved into CBT or analytic or systems or existential or behavioral or cognitive or, you know, focus on processes of change and build uh, interventions that people really want. Mm -hmm. uh, I give you a, a kind of an odd example. Um, uh, these processes are very helpful to people in competitive sports. Mm -hmm. Who knew? But they are. <laughs> So the Chinese Olympic coaches are teaching their athletes about emotional openness and cognitive flexibility. That's a very uh, interesting. I just spent uh, a week at spring. I spent a week at spring training at the Major League Baseball before COVID shut it down, because there's one of the Major League Baseball teams have gone all in on ACT for all of their baseball players. Oh, it's just one <laughs> tiny little example. One tiny little example where could we take what will help you with racial conflicts, but not just that, mm -hmm. with trauma, but not just that, with your willingness to, to overcome your fears and be all you can be at business or in school, but not just mm -hmm. that, to not have your relationships break up and have to go through yet another round because you didn't know how really to love and to not run away when it was hard. I mean, could we put liberation processes everywhere? And uh, we've, when we've done that in the area of, of uh, ethnicity and race, it's had good outcomes. There's three or four pretty good studies about that with, as an intervention. Um, and, and maybe some people will think, oh, that's so indirect what you're talking about. I don't know. I, I, what I'm talking about is evolving a culture that's mm -hmm. kinder, that's more compassionate, mm -hmm. that's more mindful, and that's more values-based. Mm -hmm. And if we had that, you know, when we come to something like mm -hmm. poverty or like uh, global warming or like displaced peoples or, or like you know, institutionalized racism. We're going to have the psychological tools to do what's hard, mm. even if it means changes with ourself. Mm. Um, so let's start. Let's start now, and let's start everywhere. But do it in a way that's not uh, that that where what you do over here is helpful over there. Yeah. Yeah. The example I was using of sports. The baseball team I'm working with has put these flexibility processes into the work that the physical therapists do when the, when the players are injured. It turns out about one out of four of baseball players are injured at any one moment. It's an amazing number. Oh, I mean, I didn't yeah. know that, but a lot of them are going through injury. And if they can't solve it, they may lose their career. So it's yeah. very important to them. They're, they're professional athletes. Yeah? 
but the people working with them on on following their exercises and doing their stretching and and scary things like that you know now you have to try again knowing full well you could be injured again mm -hmm. yeah. You know, but then over here with having the mental preparedness to be able to, uh, let's say, deal with uh, uh, the uh, fans constantly criticizing you or times where you have to sit on the bench and another player is playing, but you want to be a good teammate. Um, or when you're dealing with people who have speak a language in a part of your baseball team that you don't understand. Mm -hmm. um, so... Maybe it, maybe it's uh, uh, a little bit utopian, but I don't think too much that if, if we learn as a human community to turn to the behavioral scientists for some input, I don't know if this has happened in your country, but in ours with the COVID crisis, we have epidemiologists, so we have a lot of virologists, we have public health people. We don't see any behavioral people at all, behavioral people at all. Mm -hmm. So when they say, they say, you must wear a mask. Well, that's behavior change. Yeah. How are you going to get them to wear a mask? Yeah. You must not touch your face. Okay, great. That's behavior change. How are you going to get people not to touch your face? Don't do it. <laughs> do you know the data on instructions? Yeah. Hey, weren't you ever a parent? Just <laughs> your kids not to do it? Come on. Half of them are going to want to... You know, do show the exact you, oh, you know, don't put beans. <laughs> yeah, yeah. you do the exact opposite. Yes. Did you never have children? <laughs> <laughs> so it's just a little example how I think we got to get the psychologists and the, you know, the behavioral scientists out of just thinking about the one out of five who might have mental mm -hmm. illness and start thinking about the five out of five who need mental resilience. Mm -hmm because we all have psychological challenges. And yeah. The challenge of uh, racism is one of the hardest because it's in you. It's in every one of us. Yeah. You know, black, brown, white, doesn't matter. It's in all of us. And, um, and you, there's no delete button in the nervous system. There's no eraser. So you're going to have to do something wiser than just pretending that it's not in you. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I think what you just said about, you know, um, focusing not just on the individuals who are displaying uh, difficulties, but really thinking about it in terms of just the human experience, because it's just, all of it is just degrees, right? Um, somebody who's experiencing dysfunction is just experiencing something at a much higher degree than somebody else is on a day-to-day -day basis, and they could easily change. We slide up and down that scale. So if we're giving people the tools they need to deal with that more effectively. Um, then regardless of where you move in terms of the scale, you're going to have something in your tool bag to help you manage that, whether it's at a low level of severity or not. Um, so that, that makes a lot of sense. And I think it's where maybe we're, we're not necessarily looking uh, hard enough in terms of putting these things into place to, to help not just with prejudice, but with all the other things that are associated with that. Um, so just to close off, uh, I, I, I know that you, you have a, a busy, busy day. Um, what would you say would be sort of a good starting point for the people listening uh, who do want to look at making a change in their own lives, um, but maybe don't yeah. necessarily know how to go about doing that, who struggle with personally struggle with racist thoughts, uh, prejudicial beliefs, or even, as you mentioned, experiential avoidance. I think a lot of us recognize that in ourselves. Sure. Uh, it's just, it's one of those things that is a bit, it seems hard to overcome because you're really so used to running away <laughs> from, from these things. So facing it yeah. head on is, is, again, part of the problem, right? So what would one, one takeaway be for somebody who wants to start this journey? Of well, a couple of a couple of things. I mean, one would be to <clears throat> work on your uh, uh, cognitive flexibility around, around judgment. To be more attentive, to watch how your mind is constantly judging people. If somebody walked into the room right now and weighed 400 pounds, as they walked in the door, it would be about 300 milliseconds before you judge them. Mm -hmm. That's a fact. 
We know that from implicit measures of cognition, yeah? If they were disfigured, same thing. If they were in a wheelchair, same thing. Uh, if they're of a different uh, ethnic group, or one, especially one that you have not been spending time with and are comfortable with, same thing. And so can we learn to catch these automatic judgments that happen like that, and then bring these skills that allow us to look at the thought with a little bit of, of psychological distance, not dissociative, protect yourself distance, but just backing up enough so that you can see it in flight. Mm -hmm. You can notice that the little mental spider is weaving the web. Yeah. Yeah. Now I'm having the thought that. Like one of the things that we do in therapy is we take a judgment and then we label the judgment in terms of what it is. Like now I'm having the feeling that. Now I'm having the thought that. Right. Turns out if you just do that, and if you had people in a, a, in a neuroimaging study, if you had something like a thought like this is awful or that person's awful or I'm awful and you said, I'm having the thought that I'm awful. I'm having the thought that this person is awful. Your brain responds to that completely differently. Psychological You're far more able to just come in. Right. There's a little distance there. And then noticing that gives you a little more flexibility as to what the next moment is. What are you right. going to attend to? Right. Where you, and, and so it isn't that we're going to be constantly looking at, for example, prejudiced thoughts. We notice and then we come into the present moment. And there you may find some other opportunities like being able to do something that's pro-social or not to eliminate this, but just to as sort of a declaration of independence. Right. You know, that, uh, that, for example, you know, that judgment comes up, you catch it, and then your eyes come to the person, and then you're asking, how are they doing? And then you're trying to bring full mindful ears to it and really listen, mm -hmm. and to take that time to go behind their eyes and get perspective on what it is they're feeling and what they're saying, and try to come into a real human connection yeah. that doesn't eliminate your racist history yeah it doesn't take it away there's no eraser but what it does is like having a glass with uh, you know quarter quarter of the glass is filled with water that's too, too salty and pouring in some fresh water if you pour in enough that glass will be very drinkable mm. you're not going to get out the tweezers and take out the salt crystals mm -hmm. If you went in and tried to remove every, every little prejudice, joke, image, thought that you had had, it would spend the rest of your life, number one, you'd be making them the focus of all your attention, which means they'd be more dominant, not less. And there's no way to really eliminate them anyway. You might get your tweezers on them, but you're not going to be able to pull them out by the root. So yeah. could we take this more mindful attention of noticing, I've just given you one of about, 500 we call them diffusion techniques right that reduce the domination of judgmental language mm -hmm. and i'm having the thought that is just one tiny little thing you don't say it out loud people think you're weird but you can say it inside or in therapy yeah. i'll give you a couple more examples uh, we will take uh, thoughts that hit us harshly that we can kind of catch that are prejudice or stigmatizing and we say them in a silly voice. Uh, you can uh, pick a cartoon character you like, <laughs> or maybe your least favorite politician. Uh, I won't tell you who mine is, but you can probably guess. Um, so my uh, children love this, by the way, because yeah. children need some training in this. You know, yes. if they have a thought like I'm bad mm -hmm. or that person's bad, you know, uh, we, we will do what we call silly voices with kids. And so maybe Donald Duck says, <laughs> uh, that's to, it doesn't land. <laughs> that's, you know, so now two of maybe 500, there's so many things we can do. Yeah. That what they do, here's what they do is instead of trying to subtract the thought, you change your relationship to the thought mm. so that it, lands on you differently it's mm -hmm. part of your life but in a different way yeah and then you can add the fresh water of connection 
values-based communication, participation, contribution, pro-social engagement. Mm -hmm. And that's true in uh, all of these difficult areas. And uh, when we've done randomized trials with that, with regard to racial prejudice, we show that we can not only reduce enacted stigma, we can reduce the psychological impact of being the recipient of it, and we can reduce the implicit racism, not just the explicit. Right. Because one of the problems, when you come in with just normal training around racism, what people do is they mm -hmm. they learn not to say the wrong thing. Yeah, and social desire. That can actually make it worse. And yeah. so you get explicit changes, but not implicit changes. Yeah. But with these more playful methods, like I'm just talking about, if you get interested, the act a book, act literature, liberated mind, get out of your mind into your life. Those are the ones I've done, but there's hundreds of act books uh, and not just act, but uh, books on uh, uh, mindfulness based methods and values methods will give you tools you can use. If you don't want to buy a book, just Google it. Mm -hmm. uh, you can watch my my um, TEDx talks. I have one where I go through twelve different diffusion methods, right. including the ones, uh, some of the ones I've just men mentioned. So, a lot of this can be done for free. And um, maybe while we're at, uh, you know, uh, I don't know if it's how it is in your country, but here we're spending a lot of time at home with yeah. COVID. So, uh, people are spending some time doing um, things online or in reading that uh, are mental resilience training and it's helpful to them in dealing with COVID and yeah. the worries that are there about their family and their health and so forth, but yeah. can also be helpful in creating greater connection and community around uh, issues of diversity and ethnicity and race. That's, I think the whole world has realized uh, time's up Mm -hmm. it's time for us to do something yeah thank you so much for sharing all of that and also for the very interesting tips at the end i think those are things that anyone can try at any time so thank you for that yeah. um and thank you for taking the time to talk to us today really appreciate that um so i'm just gonna wrap it up um thank you everyone for tuning into this episode of the empowering lives video series for more information on Professor Hayes and his work, you can visit his website at stephenchayes.com. To find out more about the psychology department here at Help University, you can visit us at help.edu.my. Until next time, thank you for watching and take care. Thank you so much, Professor. <laughs>